It is our great pleasure and honor to introduce Barbara Asciotti. She's going to be speaking on United in Faith. And we'd like to give her a big round of applause. one and 
only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. John 3.16. My friends, I kid you not, from that day forward, my life began to change. I started reading lives, uh, books on lives of the saints. I started watching YouTube videos of testimonials of how people met Christ and how their lives changed. I immersed myself in reading the scriptures. And that's when I realized that God is love. And I was in awe of him. And I didn't care about doing those things as do not end up in hell. I wanted to do those things that Christ taught us because I'm excited to one day be reunited with Him, our Creator, our Father. I choose every day to repent. And what does it mean to repent? It means to have a change of mind. I want to do for Christ to pick yourself up and continue to grow in virtues. It has been six years since then, and I'm living a more happier and fuller life. Did Christ speak to me because I was chosen or I was special? No. He did it because He loved me so much that He died to give me a life of abundance. And that's His promise to everyone. But you must decide if you want it. We have so many struggles in this life, and we have passions allow to consume us. For example, pride, anger, jealousy, addictions of the flesh and the mind. We need to tame those things and use the gift that God has given us to do good things. I want to share my favorite books from the Bible. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. John 15, 5. The last part for me is so true. I've experienced this. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. When we make the decision to follow Christ, then we allow Christ to come in and change us. But we cannot do so without our free will. All we have to do is make the decision and the rest God takes care of. Isn't that amazing? Just like a tree's roots run deep in the earth, we also become rooted in Christ. At that moment of our decision, the Holy Spirit fills us and we begin to take action for our soul. When we begin to participate in the church's sacraments, we begin to understand the importance of our church. So that brings us to the church. Who is the church? In our study Bible, it writes that all together we comprise the church. St. Paul says in Ephesians 5 to 3, Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. He also says that you are the body of Christ, individually members of it. 1 Corinthians 12, 27, and that we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Romans 12, 5. So Christ is ahead, we are the body, together we become one. In the human body, all organs have their function and all work in unison to sustain us. <coughs> We're all different, but we're all needed in the church. Thus, we stand united and we continue what Christ established with his own blood. The church is our salvation in Christ. We must protect it from society's corrupt views. The church is God's kingdom here on earth. Every divine liturgy is us worshiping and glorifying Christ our God together with all the saints angels and the Virgin Mary, just like they do in heaven. It is a mystery, because we cannot see with our physical eyes. But if we were to see with our spiritual eyes, we would see this beautiful mystery. And God has shown this mystery and this phenomenon to many saints, and they have gone on to give us accounts of this. Saint Filipina is one of those saints where he 
he saw the seraphim and the cherubim in the altar with him. Our church has remained the same since the day of Pentecost some 2,000 years ago. The Holy Spirit descended as tongues of fire on the apostles' heads, and they were given the authority to go out into the world and spread the word of Christ and all its truth. The church is apostolic because the first representative is Christ with the twelve apostles, and thus all our bishops have that apostolic succession as the alpha men. We are a continuation. The Orthodox faith has not changed since then. All other Christian religions chose to break and leave the succession. Now, let's talk about the sacraments. There are seven sacraments. We have baptism, chrismation, marriage, confession, holy Eucharist, ordination, and holy unction. In the Orthodox Study Bible, it says that all the holy sacraments of the Church are holy ceremonies through which the divine grace or Holy Spirit is transferred to man, which cleanses and sanctifies and guides us to our salvation. What does it mean to sanctify us? It means that Christ sets us apart for a sacred person, a purpose, sorry. It means that to free us from sin, to purify us. We begin to participate regularly in the sacraments the Holy Spirit gives us the understanding of God's truth and knowledge. Then we begin to walk in the light. Christ is our light. He sheds light on all our darkness, and we begin to experience and feel God's presence around us throughout our lives. First sacrament I want to look at is baptism. The Apostle Paul says, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life, Romans 6, 4. In our study Bible, it says that the church understood baptism as having first and second time. Our first is that we died with him on the cross, and the second is continually dying to our sins daily as we walk in the newness of life. It's like we get a do-over. Even though for our sins, we're allowed every day because we've been baptized to become new, a new person with Christ. <coughs> when we come up from the water, this means our new life in Christ, our new birth and entrance into God's kingdom. John 3, 3. Baptism is so important, for at the same time we're given chrismation, another of the sect sacraments. It's the anointing of the holy, holy oil which represents the Holy Spirit. It's the seal that you have become a citizen in God's kingdom. This anointing is the power of Christ in your lives. It is our flame that is lit so that we may know all truth and knowledge of Christ. But as we get older and begin to allow our flesh and passions to take over, our flame becomes less lit. But we have the power to ignite that flame. How? By wanting and deciding to put Christ in our lives. We must be doers of Christ's word, not just hearers. Jesus was obedient through all his trials that he endured on this earth. And so, when we participate in the sacraments, we become obedient to Christ, and we are closely united with him. Submit to 
each other. Now, the husband is the icon of Christ, and the wife is the icon of the church. This means that the husband is to serve God as the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church, Ephesians 5 to 3. And the wife is subject to her husband, as the church is subject to Christ, Ephesians 5 to 4. For some of you, you may be thinking that this is just the wife being oppressed, but it's quite the contrary. The church is not oppressed in relationship to Christ. Just like Christ nurtures and cherishes his church, we are his church, and the husband nurtures and cherishes his wife. The crowns in the ceremony are simply to bind to each other. This means putting yourselves first. The society has made it about what you can get out of a relationship, not what you can give. And in my opinion, I think this is why we have so many failed marriages. Our Bible tells us that Christian marriage helps us understand the mystery of the church. The very model of Christ and the church. You see, in the church, we are one humanity, one flesh with Christ. In marriage, husband and wife are one flesh with each other. When I began to change, I started wanting to do for my husband. But before, I was concentrating on all this negative support guy. <laughs> but then, I saw my own faults and weaknesses, and how patient he was with me. And I was so grateful that he still, I still had a love with you. But I would have never if I didn't ask God for his insight by prayer and coming to church. When we put ourselves first, Christ sees our efforts and he blesses our marriage and helps our spouse do the same for us. My mom used to tell me, model the behavior you want your husband to treat you with and with God's grace, he will treat you that way. You know she was right. It wasn't so easy at first, but as soon as you decide to give it a try, Christ steps in and he takes over. He gives us strength and the will to continue to do so. Our relationships become stronger. We feel closer, more loving, patient, and understanding of each other. In short, we become happier. And you can do that with all your relationships, not just with your spouses. The next sacrament is confession. This one is very important, and I see many young people have a problem with this. I hear it often that if we confess our sins to God in prayer, then it is all we need. But I'm here to tell you that Christ instructed his disciples to forgive sins. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. John 20:23. 20, why would Christ say this if he wanted to do it only in prayer? Christ also appointed the twelve disciples to go and teach the word of Christ. He said to them, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. John 15, 16. He also went further and promised that it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Mark 13, 11. This is proof that Christ set in place the order of the church and how he wants it to run. In the early church, we see that Christians confess publicly. James writes in 5.16, Confess your trespass to one another. As time went by, the church grew in numbers, and many strangers also came to witness the church. So the priests began to hear confessions privately. So we confess before um, the icon of Christ in front of the priest and he reads the prayer of forgiveness. He guides us spiritually. The priest is like a doctor. He gives us a prescription of what we need to heal and progress in our spiritual life. He becomes enlightened by the Holy Spirit and then he's able to guide us. Our sins can burden us so that we feel that we're carrying a ton of bricks on our backs. This feeling is present in life very often. We worry, we have lots of anxiety about different things, like difficult relationships, 
Citizens' arguments, pressures from work and family obligations, these can tire us out completely, leaving us depleted and weak. So the devil takes advantage of this, and he starts to put wrong ideas and lies of the situations around us, so that we can misunderstand people and grow wary. So to giving you a new strength and insight, you can go for confession. I know when I leave the church after confession, I am so light and free. I have so much joy, it feels like I'm a part of the offering that you open up and I'm fizzing with happiness. This, my friends, is the same feeling you have when you're falling in love with someone. When you see your partner, you get those butterflies in your stomach and you start feeling giddy. That's the feeling you will have when you start knowing Christ and putting Him in your life. You fall in love all over again, and then you'll do anything to get that feeling back. So you work harder to get closer to God, for you know and understand completely that only He can sustain you in all trials and afflictions in your life. In Psalm 51, King David writes after he confessed his sins, the joy of salvation was restored to him. So he's telling us, confess your sins and you shall have joy. This brings us to the Holy Eucharist, the ultimate in beauty of the sacraments. It is the supreme act of thanksgiving and praise to God and His Church. The Divine Liturgy is where the bread and wine is consecrated and it becomes Christ's actual body and blood through a mystery. Christians drink this for the remission of their sins. This is Christ giving us His whole self as we become one with Him. He runs through our veins. Talk about the ultimate unity. For Christ said, All who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me while I am found in them. John 6, 56. Christ instructs us and tells us, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. John 6, 51. There you have it. Do you want to live? Then you must choose Christ and live His sacraments. There are prayers we read to prepare for Holy Communion, and they are so beautiful. One prayer written from St. John Chrysostom says that we partake of the Holy Mysteries for forgiveness of sins, everlasting life, for sanctification, enlightenment, strength, healing, health of soul and body. Look at all that God gives us. Next time you're in church, think of all these things and all that Christ endured and did for us and truly ask Him for His forgiveness. Remember how much you are loved by Him and set your minds on the spiritual things that are taking place in front of you. You shall feel the warmth in your heart, a delight that is so powerful that you can't help but know that you honor in the presence of God. Our divine liturgy is alive. It awakens your senses. You're smelling the incense. You're hearing the hymns being chanted, the epistle and the gospel being read, and it causes you to travel to heaven without leaving your seat. You become one body and one soul. Do you see how important these sacraments are? They fill us up with Christ, and they unite us. They keep that flame in baptism, lit and strong. The last two sacraments are ordination of our deacons, priests, and bishops, and the holy unction, the consecration of the olive oil, and the anointment of those who are ill. We see in this ministry that Christ ordained and set in place the twelve apostles to go and bear fruit, and that fruit should remain. John 15, 16. In the New Testament, the twelve apostles were the first bishops and overseers of the church. In the sacrament of ordination, our bishop places his hand on top of the man's head who is to become a deacon or priest or bishop. In the Bible, if you read the Acts, 
Acts, it tells us that Peter instructed the people to go out, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Acts 6, 1 through 6. Then it goes on to say that they did this by the laying of their hands on them. Acts 6, 6. Ordination is the eternal appointment, for the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Tells us that in Romans 11 to 9. Sorry, 11 to 29. As I mentioned before, this is how we continue to ordain our deacons and priests and bishops. And the succession has been passed down and continued from the early church of the apostles. Holy unction can be performed throughout the year. This is what we call the Aferion, where the priest goes into the home of a person who is sick and reads prayers for the sick and consecrates the olive oil and then anoints the person who is sick and all his family members who are present. This is God's medicine too. We also see it done on Holy Wednesday when the priest anoints everyone at the church. We need to believe and have faith that this sacrament helps with our healing from both physical and spiritual ailments. In conclusion, I hope that you have a better understanding of the sacraments and how they are important for our salvation. They are our weapons against this corruption of the world. I also hope and pray that you will decide to put Christ in their lives so that you may experience an everlasting joy that will keep growing the more you get closer to Christ. I'm not a theologian. I'm just a simple woman who decided to know God and want to live His way. He tells us, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is He who loves me. And He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love Him and manifest myself to Him. John 14, 21. The next quote from the Bible is the very essence of how all the sacraments work through the Holy Spirit. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I sent to you. John 14, 26. I have been given this opportunity to express my experiences and to encourage you in your journey to find Christ. And I guarantee you will be transformed into someone who full of light and joy. Then you will go on to share your story, and you will encourage and bring someone closer to Christ. And they will do the same, and so forth. And this is how we become united. Thank you very much.
Um, like I said, I was fighting depression, and as soon as I met Christ, and He spoke to me that day, and He speaks to every single person if they want to hear. So because I was, I think, in the church, even though I wasn't understanding it, that that um, this kid, that Holy Spirit was upon me. So eventually, God knew when I was going to be ready, and He opened Himself to me, and He spoke to me. And I think that can happen for everyone, and it will happen in a different time in everyone's life, and your experience obviously will um, bring you there. So absolutely, yes, my life is happier, full, um, uh, you know, there's struggles and there's uh, difficulties, but I remain peaceful with them because I know I have Christ and He always, always helps me do it. Thank you very much. Another one? Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, but I want to say something about <laughs> <laughs> So by growing, I think you're 16, huh? Okay. <laughs> so uh, by growing like uh, every day, so you will have, have a different understanding experience joy in a different way. So maybe uh, for you and for most of you, the joy that uh, the church uh, speaks about it, it's not like uh, the way that you understand. But um, uh, I have a lot of experience that I'm 42 during 43. Uh, so that in, uh, in many places I've experienced a lot in my life, you know, I was born in Greece, I grew up in Germany, so I was in Africa for two years, and then I started in the United States, I came here, I've been almost everywhere. Uh, and um, I've experienced a lot, and I know that uh, the only joy, the real joy that fulfills the soul, this is the joy that um, given, um, given by the church by Christ, is a joy that you cannot compare to any other Savior. And uh, of course I'm not here to convince you, uh, but uh, it convicts uh, some of you uh, because the joy that um, you receive uh, from God is a joy that uh, uh, you have to experience by yourself. So you may not have like, any kind of joys uh, in the life, but by growing up and uh, building a relationship with God, you will see that uh, uh, you will be able to set everything that you possess.
doing something for my future, doing something for like, let's say the environment. Uh, if I do something and help an animal or like pick up trash and like just just do something that contributes or like sign a petition, uh, raise awareness about like global warming and everything, and then that makes me feel like better about myself and that's what keeps me like from going crazy sometimes. And I really respect like religion. I think it's amazing how some people can get how close some people can get with God and it's it's mind blowing just the fact that from depression, like your story, you went to like a happy life. And, but I think it's not for everyone, like to be honest or the answer for some people could even be a sin, like it's like to be proud and to do things that make me proud and I'm not ashamed of that. Absolutely. Um, but that journey, that desire, desire that you have to help someone, that's your good, right? That's God that is still that in you. And it's not about you being proud or sinful and you know you but that's what we are. God knows our, our, our nature. We are going to sin. And he still loves us. And it's okay because you're you're growing and you're learning things about you and who you want to become. And I think like um, for a lot of us we place uh, the sins like a lot of emphasis on that and the bad and the good. But for Christ it's not. It's about you knowing that you sin. He convicts us. He, he kind of tells us inside that we're going wrong, okay? And then he steers in the right direction. But for that to happen, you have to allow him to do that. So, like, you know how you were saying you were crying in your bed and you still have to talk to him? Continue to talk to him, even when you're angry. Continue to tell him how you feel without thinking, I'm sinning because he's God. Why am I talking to him this way? He still loves you unconditionally, always and forever. Yeah, but so do, so do like, uh, like close like family members and people. I'm sure like they love me too because like family and, and that's an important bond. But at the same time, I feel like more comfortable like, like feeling vulnerable, like exposing myself to my friends and people who are like there for me every day than to like like family members that I'm not that close to and also like God. So you're kind of saying like it feels weird to tell God? Yeah, because I don't get a response and I don't right. like that kind of like loving. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> this is a great conversation, but we're going to continue tomorrow. Uh, I'm going to present tomorrow, please. Hope you do it. Oh! oh. But if we have any other questions, that are specific to the topic. We have one quick second, we have one more question, yeah. And then we have to go very quickly because we're gonna get on the bus in two seconds for one more question. And then we'll continue this conversation tomorrow. Hi,
your community and your spiritual family will provide you those resources as well. Again, we can get into it more tomorrow if we have to go, but I just wanted to make that point. And you want to remind me about it tomorrow? Then we'll go we'll further into that. Okay, one more round for Barbara, please.